morning comes from the Gospel of John. This is chapter 1, and we pick up in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning, and everything came into being through the Word. And without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The Word became flesh and made His home among us. We have seen His glory, glory like that of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And John testified about Him, crying out, This is the One of whom I said, He who comes after Me is greater than Me because He existed before Me. From His fullness we have all received grace upon grace, as the law was given through Moses. So grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son who is at the Father's side, has made God known. The Word of God for the people of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. second reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. So this is chapter 4, also beginning in verse 1. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you receive from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one Spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. God has given His grace to each one of us, measured out by the gift that is given by Christ. That's why Scripture says, when He climbed up to the heights, He captured prisoners and He gave gifts to people. What does the phrase, He climbed up, mean if it doesn't mean that He had first gone down into the lower regions of the earth? The one who went down is the same one who climbed up above all the heavens so that He might fill everything. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of fullness of Christ. As a result, we aren't supposed to be infants any longer who can be tossed and blown around by every wind that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way into Christ who is the head, 
The whole body grows from him as it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does their part. So I'm telling you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. You shouldn't live your life like the Gentiles anymore. They base their lives on pointless thinking, and they are in the dark in their reasoning. They're disconnected from God's life because of their ignorance and their closed hearts. They are people who lack all sense of right and wrong and who have turned themselves over to doing whatever feels good and to practicing every sort of corruption along with greed. But you didn't learn that sort of thing from Christ. Since you really listened to Him and you were taught how the truth is in Jesus, change the former way of life that was part of the person you once were corrupted by deceitful desires. Instead, renew the thinking in your mind by the Spirit and clothe yourselves with the new person created according to God's image in justice and true holiness. The Word of God for the people of God. God. (sighs) That was a long reading. (laughs) So last week... I put everybody on notice that I was going to attempt something that I don't typically do. Namely, I was going to try to offer a cohesive and somewhat engaging sermon series. (laughs) And that's because for the duration of my years in ministry, I've been more often than not a lectionary preacher. I've just followed along with the seasons of the church. But because we're embarking on a new thing as of July 1st, I figured I would try and stretch my comfort zone a little as well. And while in many ways we are the same, we're the same people, we're in the same building, we even have the same hymnals at this point, there are still many changes afoot, and so it seemed like an excellent time for Mount Pleasant Church to get back to basics, if you will, and look at what the Scripture teaches us in regards to what the church is and how she is supposed to operate. Who is she composed of? What are her priorities? How does she accomplish them? What are the distinct markers of her identity? From whence does her power and authority come? And so that's what we're going to be diving into for a while. And we begin today with a facet that I'm sure we're all familiar with, but maybe one that we haven't given its due respect when it comes to reflection and application. In other words, we've heard it time and time again, maybe we've even repeated it ourselves, but truthfully, it rarely enters into our mind when we think about or live as the church. So here it is. Drum roll, please. The church is the body of Christ. And if you're disappointed, if you think that was anticlimactic, I'm sorry, but such a reaction actually points to exactly why we need to talk about this concept more, because it's something that can easily be taken for granted, i.e. assumed or forgotten, and when we do, we completely miss out on the amazing power and promise that exists in such a statement, because I mean, think about it objectively. Jesus is the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, the living water, the Word, and Scripture tells us that we are His body. That's not something that should elicit a ho-hum response. It's something that should blow the doors off the building when the full implication is understood. Last Sunday when we celebrated communion and I prayed over the elements, We prayed, Lord, make these be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. Did you sense any slightest ripple of excitement move through the sanctuary? Did it not occur to you as you stood in the aisle and received the bread and the cup that those sacramental symbols, those outward signs of an inward working grace represented something so radical as to mean that we are this very day by the power of the Spirit being remade in the image of our Lord and Savior? Amen. 
When you left this place and you set about the remainder of your Sunday, did you remember that you were carrying Christ out into the community so that they might experience Him no different than you did at the chancel rail? And if your answer to any of those questions is no, or a very diminutive yes at best, Maybe it's because we've lost a little bit of an understanding as to what it means to be the body of Christ. Because here's the really cool thing. The body is not something we try to be. Not something we hope to be or pray to be one day. It's something that we are. We simply need to wake up to the fact. It's like Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5 about salt and light. He didn't say strive to be, labor to be, beg, borrow, or steal to be. He said you are salt and light. And brothers and sisters, you are, we are the body of Christ. But just as we've observed in other respects, like as it relates to independence, with great blessing comes great responsibility. You might have heard the saying, you may be the only Bible another person reads. Speaking about how our lives give witness to the truth of Scripture, even to those that have never cracked open a Bible. Well, imagine the implications of suggesting that the church is the body of Christ. It means that we have the potential to offer profound and miraculous experiences, true shalom peace, to people from all walks of life in all sorts of situations and contexts. Experiences just like those we read about between Jesus and so many men and women in Scripture. But it also means when we fail to be who we have been gifted and anointed to be, the consequences extend far beyond our personal reputation or aspirations. For example, Anne Voskamp, who's a Canadian Christian author, rhetorically asked this question. She said, if the church is a body and the body is a business, isn't that the same thing as prostitution? It's a good question. Being the body of Christ means that encountering the church is supposed to be like encountering the risen Christ. We can make all kinds of excuses for why it sometimes isn't. We can find ways to rationalize and justify in order to try and get around how the church often behaves in ways that are very much opposed to the Jesus revealed in Scripture. But when the chips are down, to be the body of Christ means the church's worship, ministries, missions, evangelism, and presence within its respective communities should be like having Jesus residing in the house next door. It's reminiscent of the way Eugene Peterson translated our reading from John this morning in his message translation. Chapter 1, verse 14 reads, The Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And that is both a beautiful and a relevant rendering because we can't understand what it means to be the body of Christ until we appreciate what John's talking about in his prologue when he poetically describes the first coming of Jesus. And now I realize this isn't PBS, and you may be a little old for children's television, but from seasons 38 to 45 in Sesame Street, They experimented with complementing the famous word of the day with another segment, or the letter of the day with the segment, the word of the day. And so Elmo would come out, the little red guy, and he would introduce the word of the day. And if this sermon had a word of the day, that word would have to be incarnation. Because that's the idea at the heart of John's prologue, but it's also the fundamental concept behind Paul's words to the church in Ephesus. Incarnation simply means something has moved from the abstract to the concrete. It's gone from being an idea, a concept, a belief, to something material, physical, and tangible. Some might even say it has become real, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole this morning. 
Nonetheless, incarnation is a seemingly simple but extraordinary concept that John explains in very clear language. He says, no one has ever seen God. God, the only Son who is at the Father's side, has made God known. In other words, until Jesus... God was something people spoke about, the scribes and experts read about, the religious leaders talked about, but no one had ever laid eyes upon. Sure, Moses had the experience of the burning bush and there was the whole God passing by while standing in the cleft of the rock thing. He even had the pillars of cloud and fire that the Israelites followed through the wilderness, but no one had ever really seen God. The Jewish people had the Torah and the prophets and the traditions and the temple, but in Jesus Christ, they finally had a person. A person who came not to abolish all these other things, but to fulfill them. A person who said time and time again, you have heard it said, but I tell you. A person who pointed to the prophets and declared the days of their promises had come to pass. A person who was the pure love, justice, and truth of God, but with flesh, blood, and sinews. And so John wrote, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace as the law was given through Moses. So grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. And nothing would ever be the same again. You could spend years trying to exhaust the significance of God made flesh. The authors of the New Testament letters frequently touch on the fact that the creator of the universe condescended to take on the body of his creation. It is stranger than fiction. It's more amazing than words could ever describe. And yet there it is. Here's an example of how you can get just the faintest taste of how radical a concept we're talking about. I want you to try and recall the most beautiful natural setting you have ever witnessed. Just think about it for a second. We just spent a couple nights up at Smith Mountain Lake with some friends. And on Friday night, they took us on their boat to this particular cove that had a really nice sight line. And we watched the sun slide beneath the horizon. It was stunning. All of us have experienced that sort of scene from a boat or a mountaintop or our own backyard. It shouldn't be too difficult for you to bring something to mind. But now I want you to imagine a man walking up to you, standing alongside you, and complimenting this awesome view that you're taking in. Again, not strange. We can appreciate things are beautiful. But then he turns to you and he says, in all truthful frankness, I made that. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the incarnation. And this stark reality, something that is just impossible to get our mind fully around. And yet we profess it and hold tightly to its implications, whether we discuss them or not. So let's pause for a moment because this is a lot to take in. I mean, we've covered some ground here. But I think we've made clear what the incarnation was and why it's such a big deal. But you may be wondering, why does any of this matter to us sitting here this morning? And again, I'm so glad you asked these questions. Because here's why. The Gospel of Luke closes... And the book of Acts begins with something we refer to as the ascension of Jesus. We read that he led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And as he blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. This is another one of those strange stories that we don't always know what to make of. But the gist of the matter is this. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the one that John talks about, has left the building. The Spirit is sent to us. We're not left alone. But the physical manifestation of God in the person of a man has gone elsewhere. We say, He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
What is the significance of that line from the Apostles' Creed, that profession of faith that we've recited for 1,700 years? It means this. It means between the time that Jesus departed at the Ascension and the time that He returns in the parousia, which is the theological term for the second coming, between those two times, a placeholder of sorts is required. Someone is needed to stand in the gap as the physical manifestation of this light that John says the darkness cannot overcome. Someone needs to hold the line. Enter the church. Folks, it's not a coincidence that ten days after the ascension of Jesus, something else pretty remarkable takes place. Right down the road from the Mount of Olives in Bethany. And it was called Pentecost. Less than two weeks after Jesus ascended and bodily departed from his disciples, the Spirit swept down on them in Jerusalem like a mighty rush of wind, and the church was born. The incarnational placeholder until Jesus' return had arrived. And here is where the body of Christ is a community of believers redeemed by His blood first begins to take shape. And if you go back and read the opening chapters of Acts, you can't help but notice that from the word go, it got very real, real quick. To see the church in this way fits beautifully in our theology, but it also demands that we recognize its implications for us to this very day. And those are perhaps best summed up in a poem prayer that was composed by Teresa of Avila, who was a Spanish nun back in the 16th century. This is what she wrote. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. Yours are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. That, brothers and sisters, is the truth, hope, and promise of the church as the body of Christ. And that is what Paul is talking about when he tells the Ephesians, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you receive from God. That's the call, to be the body of Christ, to conduct yourselves with all humility and gentleness and patience. Why? Because Jesus was humble and gentle and patient. To preserve the unity of the Spirit that ties you together. Because what did Jesus pray on the night before His crucifixion? I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in Me, Father, and I am in you. May they be in us so the world will believe You sent Me. The church as the body of Christ is to be one with each other for the sake of revealing God to the world. Just as Jesus was one with the Father for the sake of revealing Him to the world. Are you starting to see a pattern here? Paul tells his readers, God's purpose was to equip His people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ. You see, sometimes when we think of God's purposes, we stop with what God accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But that's an unfortunate mistake. Because when Jesus hung on the cross and He said, it's finished, He didn't mean God's purposes or plans for His creation were there and then fulfilled. Again, from our communion liturgy, where we ask for God's Spirit to make us be for the world the body and blood of Christ, we also pray these words. By the baptism of His suffering, death, and resurrection, You gave birth to Your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant. What was finished at the cross 
was humanity's slavery to sin and death. And why? So we could receive the new covenant that allows us to be the church. It can be really easy to think, why do we even need to worry about this stuff? I mean, love God, love your neighbor, enjoy life, right? And in a way, yes, it does boil down to that. But if you really love God, you want to live like He wants you to live. And you want to love your neighbor like He wants you to love your neighbor. And it turns out that the way God wants us to live and the way God wants us to love is as the body of Christ. Accepting God's gift of salvation in Jesus Christ is not the finish line. It's the starting line. Paul doesn't say, you've accepted Christ for who He is. Great job. Make sure not to forget. Occasionally congratulate yourselves and enjoy the rest of your life until you die and come into your real reward. That is not what Paul says. Now this morning, we hear Paul say, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from Him as it's joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does their part. Let's grow. In other words, we're not fully there yet. But we know where we want to end up. And we know that we can only get there together. This is where the Wesleyan concept of sanctifying grace and going on to perfection comes from. We're not baptized into a finished product. We're baptized into a process. And that process has a destination and it isn't one we choose for ourselves. It's the one that God has chosen for us. And verse 13 from our Ephesians reading says, God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. Christians are to be measured against the fullness of Christ. Do we look like, sound like, act like, love like Jesus? Because if we are the body of Christ, shouldn't we? I know it sounds like a daunting task, and it should, (laughs) because Paul reminds us we're talking about renewing the thinking of our minds by the Spirit and clothing ourselves with the new person created according to God's image. We're not talking about getting a new hairdo or trimming off a few pounds ahead of vacation season. (laughs) We're talking about being a group of people who have become God's children born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. We're talking about being a light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot extinguish the light. We're talking about Mount Pleasant Church being the Word in flesh, having moved into the neighborhood. Because that, beloved, is what it means for the church to be the body of Christ. For His purpose, we should. By His power, we can. In His Spirit, we will. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.